Uh, coming up next, we're going to continue on this theme uh, on the main stage here, just of the metaverse. Uh, so we have uh, Angie Lau, who is a uh, former B Bloomberg anchor and current founder and editor at Forecast News, based out of Hong Kong, uh, a publication that covers crypto, emerging tech, um, a lot of other awesome stuff. And she is going to be joined by Matt Maximo, who is on the research team at Grayscale, uh, the largest uh, crypto asset manager in the space. And they are going to be having a conversation about the case for the metaverse and uh, why all this that you just saw uh, matters and why you should be paying attention. So uh, take it away, Angie. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. How is everyone doing this morning? I can't hear you. This is IRL, so we get to interact with each other. We get to reach out across the metaverse. We're all here in one physical location. And one day, potentially, this will be one of the most unique experiences in our lifetime because the people that we engage with on the metaverse are actually in the same place in real life, touching things, getting swag, drinking coffee, and interacting. But this is the world we're talking about, so let's take a moment kind of like reflect and take it all in. Matt, this is the world that you and your team at Grayscale have really dived into and explored in one of the best reports on Metaverse that we've seen. So if you haven't checked it out, please do. What's, what's the current state of Metaverse? Where is this all taking us? Thanks, Angie. It's great to be here. Um, you know, the current state of the metaverse, I think, is pretty exciting and pretty interesting. Um, as we saw with that demonstration earlier, um, there's a lot of really cool things being built right now um, and a lot of cool places we can go. I think we just saw Epic Games yesterday release support for a crypto game, a Web3 game. So, um, yeah, there's just really exciting things going on. So, in terms of the metaverse, uh, you know, generation, generationally, uh, we, are, we are spanning multi-generations here. So we have people who remember MySpace from our, from our previous uh, panel to what we are building in Metaverse. I've got a five-year-old. I'm sad to report that he's addicted to his iPad right now. Uh, and growing up, that was not my experience. Uh, it was probably a different experience for you. What are we headed towards um, in terms of what you're seeing are being uh, built right now? What are the most important things you're seeing in this environment that are being built that are foundational for future metaverse? Um, I think there's a few things here. So one, we have those games like Decentraland, which are, which are kind of a proof of concept for how Web3 games can work and how they can work with on-chain assets. Um, and then we have a lot of the infrastructure and tooling that's being built as well with things like Filecoin, things like Gala, Engine, that provide um, you know, easier access for developers and creators to get involved and start building in this new environment, basically. Closer. Okay. You guys hear us okay? You guys hear us okay? Okay, good. Just want to make sure the IRL experience is good for you guys. Okay. Um, a lot of skeptics are out there as well. They might not necessarily be in this room, but everybody in this room very familiar with the skepticism, the concern. Most recently, we saw a report in uh, New York Times about a researcher who had gone into Metaverse and experienced what in real life, unfortunately, also happens uh, in terms of assault, criminality, uh, bad behavior, and this is all tra being transported in what is not structured beyond what we're experiencing, but in terms of law, in terms of good behavior, in terms of social behavior. So the skeptics have a lot of ammunition right now when we talk about the importance or the import of metaverse. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of those skeptics are just focusing on 
the bad parts of what currently exists, which is not something that's inherent to the metaverse. Um, I mean, a lot of us were probably here in the early days of the internet, early 2000s, and it was, it was the Wild West there too. Um, still is. And I think, I think a lot of those problems will become less prevalent when we see more adoption, right? More adoption, better UXs, better implementation. Because um, fundamentally, the prob couple main problems here for the crypto industry is a, a UX problem, right? Um, if a lot of us want to go play these crypto games and we're completely new to crypto, we've got to get a wallet, get some assets, transfer the money into those wallets. It, it's cumbersome and it's, it's, um, it's difficult because you're learning how to use this new system to get to playing a game which is, which is not the traditional route. Usually you just buy the game, you log in, you play, you're in there, right? So on one side, we have the crypto UX problem, which, which makes it hard for both moderation and just new players. And then on the other side, we have a monetization problem from traditional games, right? Like traditional free-to-play games are much more profitable than the original, you know, pay for the disc and then you log in and you're good to play. But they're a lot more predatory, right? Um, like the new Diablo Immortal game costs around $110,000 to complete. Um, that's pretty ridiculous. Hundred, so, so in the lifetime of that game, to win you'd have to shell out $110,000. Or to complete, not even win, to complete the game. Pretty much, if you want to achieve like, like top tier status in that game, you've got to either spend, you, you basically have to spend $100,000 in the game. So, so to that point, the monetization problem isn't necessarily there for the companies, but it's there for the users, right? And if these problems keep persisting, um, it's just, it, we'll see a big shift, I think, towards alternative strategies. And I think crypto could be a very big, um, you know, opportunity there. It's almost challenging the capitalistic nature of gaming. So on one hand, you have huge conglomerates, traditional gaming companies who are in closed ecosystem and who create a world in which you want to trade your time and also give money versus a decentralized optionality in the metaverse where you're experiencing things, things feel a little bit more democratic, the user experience is more democratized, but then comes the monetization issue. Because if it's decentralized, how do you own a piece of it? How do you monetize? And if you can't monetize, how do you create value or even fund your ideas? So inherently, therein lies the issue. Or is it too black and white? What's What's the gray in grayscale from your view? <laughs> Sorry, I'm a journalist, so I had to do that. Um, I, think, I think it's just a very unique opportunity because in the past, there's always been these sort of secondary markets that come up around video games. Um, I mean, I grew up buying accounts and buying in-game items on these black market websites. Um, I think what was lacking was the tools for these companies to actually build open systems that bring value back to the players. So like with CSGO, um, you can buy skins, there's marketplaces, some of them go for tens of thousands of dollars. But you're very limited in that system, right? So if you quit playing the game, you might end up with very expensive assets, but you know, they're hard to liquidate. Same problem we have with NFTs right now. There's some illiquidity there. Um, so I just think, I think this provides a really unique opportunity to advance and sort of change the way gaming in general works, uh, making it more equitable for players, making it easier to monetize for companies. Um, and, and the cool thing is this can happen over a, a big spectrum of ways, right? You can be a fully on-chain game like Decentraland, or you could be like World of Warcraft with only cosmetic items implemented on-chain, right? So, so there's, there's a huge opportunity for, for everyone to sort of partake in this and ultimately make gaming experiences better, I think. So we've gone through Web 2, and we've experienced the highs and the lows. Facebook, uh, Twitter, all of these social media platforms have really defined not only this generation, but for all of us. It has, it has created social and personal change in the way that we interact with each other. So why, what, what's happening in the metaverse? Why are we diving deeper into the digital world 
when don't I just want to hang out with you, Matt, here? Don't I want to just hang out with all of you in real life and see your faces and see your reactions in real time that our, our human senses react like this? Don't we, what, what, why make the case for the metaverse? What's, why do we want that? I, I think there's a common misconception when people hear the metaverse and they think, it's, it's the push to build technology and systems that will revolution or change, I guess, physical experiences to be all of us wearing VR headsets, right? Walking around in these metaverses, controlled by Facebook, whatever it is. Um, and I, I think that's a bit misleading. I think really what we're trying to build towards is, is, is like real digital ownership, right? Because before Bitcoin, there was no way to own, to truly own digital assets unless you held the, the computer that held the, the files, or um, the storage that held your files, right? And, and so now, now, now we have a way to, to, to really just own it. We spend so much of our daily lives online, playing games, on Zoom, on social media, but there's just no ownership over anything. Same way we were talking about Instagram pictures earlier, right? Where, where do you hold those things in a way where you have value in these digital worlds? And the answer is you don't really right now. Um, those tool, that, that tooling didn't exist. Right now it's still very premature, still being built out, but we're getting there. Um, and things like, things like Filecoin, like decentralized storage, really have an opportunity to give us um, you know, a stake in what we're doing online right now. This is my theory, hear me out. We now live in a world where inflation and uh, the global economy has really disenfranchised an entire generation. For the first time, our children do not guarantee, it is not guaranteed that they, they will do better than us. The social ladder, the capital ladder is broken. And so here is a world in which value can be created for a generation that sees value in it, because at the end of the day, what is a paper dollar worth? It's the perception of what you are wanting to trade for it because of the perception of value. And with metaverse, for an entire generation and those beyond, is creating value for digital content. To your point, if I can't afford real estate in Hong Kong, and frankly, who can? Uh, maybe I can afford a piece of that in Metaverse, and that's being built out right now. The fractionalized value from a digital point of view that is tied to real life, but creates value for a whole population of people that might have been disintermediated from today's standard of value. Yeah, and, well, on that note, Michael Saylor, when he's talking about Bitcoin, he loves to talk about how Bitcoin and money is really a representation of your energy, right? You're storing the energy you spent to go, to go work, right? To the, for that same, in that same sort of concept, we spend eight hours of our day on average online, whether it's social media, video games. I think the average player spends like 16 hours a week playing video games in the US. Um, you know, for how much time we're spending online, we're not extracting, we're not getting any of that value. Um, whether it's your data, whether it's the items you spent so long earning in a game. Um, and there's always been an attempt, like with those black markets, to get, extract value out of those games and out of your time spent. Um, there's, there's communities, there's whole communities in Venezuela, the Philippines, that are, that are actively playing games like RuneScape that were made 10, 15 years ago. Um, you know, playing the game, earning items, selling them on these websites, and, and making great livings, right? Um, there's always been a drive to try and extract that value. There hasn't really been a way to do so yet. And so, um, you know, that, that, I think that's what, like, the whole metaverse concept is, is trying to get there. So we're doing reporting, obviously, from our vantage point in Asia. We cover this space, and we include Asia's perspective uh, as part of this innovation story. When we look at emerging markets and the kind of adoption, we saw Axie Infinity coming out of the Philippines months before every VC in the world wanted to get into GameFi because uh, of the opportunity there. Here you were 
Philippines ravaged by COVID, the economy completely frozen. People literally cannot support their families. They, can, they cannot get food. They cannot support themselves. This is a country where remittances are a significant part of their GDP because their families have to leave the country to send money back to support their families back home. And here you are in the center of the storm. Here comes Axie Infinity. This is a game, this is an NFT game, this is a play to earn game. And all of a sudden, you saw people being able to support family, make money. Uh, it cost $1,500, people got scholarships. Uh, we now know how that game structure uh, needs to be revised, obviously. But the reason why it catapulted so quickly was the need of an emerging market economy of people to engage because that was an opportunity to create livelihood where the real world fell down. Yeah, and that's, that's the thing about these, you know, metaverses or, or virtual games is, is there's really strong and valuable economies that get built up around them whether the game developers want it or not. Um, and and the, really, the amazing thing about crypto is it really removes the global boundaries of finance, right, which is fundamentally what every, everyone lives off of. And, and to, these, to, to the point of these people in the Philippines, without the crypto base layer of being able to transfer value uh, permissionlessly, that would not have been possible. It would have been much more difficult. Uh, and so, so I think Axie was just a really, really strong proof of concept in how valuable these economies are. And I think it'll be a good um, you know, point of reference for a lot of these existing gaming companies that are looking at Axie and saying, okay, we have these these really strong, popular franchises that have survived the last 20 years, how can we continue to monetize this game, continue to develop this game in a way that will be advantageous for our players as well as us? And I think the role of the developer and pretty much everybody in this audience and everybody who's attending Phil Austin and Consensus this week really have a moral responsibility in that We've got to think about what are the standards we want to put in place in metaverse that elevate the human experience and excise the things that aren't so cool, don't feel good, and are unsafe. What are the challenges? Do, do you see the industry understanding that as they build out metaverse? What, in your view, how... How should that be put in place, if at all? I think we'll see a lot of the, I think we'll see a lot of those challenges get addressed with the big players coming in. Um, you know, with like the likes of Epic Games coming in supporting these types of plat or these types of games. Um, you know, as as established gaming companies, they also have their own reputation, standards, etc. to uphold. So they're likely not going to go support a game that's rampant with a bunch of issues, scams, fraud. Um, so there, you know, that I think will help drive the industry forward a bit. I think it'll help solve a lot of those UX problems as well, giving players a, a familiar on-ramp into these, these metaverses. Um, yeah, I think, I, I think over time these, these will smoothen out the way that, these issues will smoothen out the way that they have for most industries. Um, we're really only, what, like a year or two like truly into the metaverse. I mean, Decentraland's been around for a long time. Um, but even then, you know, it still requires a lot of building. There's a lot of, of upfront work you have to do to really develop these things. And so now I think we're really starting to see that the development of these actual metaverses with, with real users coming in, real assets being put on chain, um, and real value being created in these communities. You know, we were chatting before we got to chat with you because we wanted to shape this conversation. We've got just a minute left. Cybersecurity, this is not a developer issue though. It's an industry-wide issue. Should there be guardrails put in place, bad behavior, get kicked out, uh, you know, uh, and or 
a tribunal or s some sort of scenario where there can be effect, effect, um, and, and consequences to action. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of those things will be built um, on either a case-by-case -case basis, like a game-by-game -game basis or um, ecosystem. So, um, you know, a lot of these players, even if they're playing fully on-chain games, will likely have to go through some sort of centralized portal or interface. And I think a lot of those issues will probably be solved um, on the interface level. So internally at Grayscale, what's next for the company as they look at Metaverse? Yeah, I mean, the Metaverse is something that we're really excited about, um, keeping close tabs on. We're really excited about not only just the Metaverse, but the tooling that's coming along with it. Um, Things like Filecoin are really important to the metaverse itself, but also other aspects of crypto. And so um, personally, I, I really like the infrastructure layer of this whole ecosystem. And so for me, it's really interesting to see um, how these different trends in crypto, DeFi, metaverse, whatever it is, um, how they kind of take advantage of the existing infrastructure that exists and how they sort of build that up. Um, in terms of the metaverse, I'm really excited to see you know, the new games that come up. There's a lot of cool stuff coming on Gala. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff also happening with a lot of these centralized um, traditional gaming companies. So I think, I think for me, the most exciting thing will be to see how you know, metaverse Web3 integrates itself into traditional gaming and how we'll see it shape the future of um, you know, just the industry as a whole. Well, I'll add a page. Here at Forecast, uh, we believe in Metaverse. We have just launched our NFT-based membership, and we are building a, what we believe to be a hybrid positioning for future media companies. Because what happens in real life, as we discuss this, this can also happen in Metaverse, where if you can't be here in Austin this week, that we can be global, we can be globally connected. Uh, and uh, I, I think we're still in the prologue phase. It's gaming, it's real estate, it's publishing, it's content creating, and it really is, I hope, the best reflection of us from real life to the metaverse. If you folks have not checked out the report, it's grayscale.com, and find the metaverse report there. And if you want uh, more in-depth coverage, we'd love for you to check us out, forecast.news. Uh, Matt, what a pleasure as always. Thank you so much. Thanks, Angie. Thanks, guys.